sugar, <laughs> and then you drink that, and you yeah, and you're ready to go, you know. Corn radio, baby. They also yeah. want to get a rundown from your book on, you know, the funniest stories that you've obtained in your long, long decades of being a soldier in the Balkans. Yeah, what are your funniest, was, funniest stories, Roland? Yeah, there are quite some. I mean, when you see my book, it's always, it's, it's, uh, I, it's uh, one chapter is a, it's a, maybe a sad story. Then the next one is, is full of action. And then I see that the next chapter is a little bit more funny, you know, because uh, you can't only write about the bad things. Of more than uh, after 20 pages, nobody wants to continue reading the book, you know, because it's, it becomes too sad. So there are some funny stories. I remember there was a guy in, in uh, Kosovo in my group and we, yeah. had to, uh, we had to go to another village because we heard that the enemy was in the village. And uh, yeah. uh, we went there and then I, I looked okay. at my, my guys and one guy was missing, you know. I said, where's the guy, you know? And then uh, another soldier pointed with a finger to me towards the house. And uh, this guy, what he was doing, my, my soldier, he, uh, because we were all dirty, you know, it was during the war and we never had the opportunity to wash. He saw that farmhouse. It was empty, but it was very near the enemy. So he went inside, made a fire in the kitchen, made, made himself some hot water. And then he found some, some small metal vessel, a big metal, like, uh, how you say, like a, like a passing tube. Almost, like a bucket. Almost, a bucket. You know? He put it full of water, yeah, big yeah. bucket, but a very big bucket. He was a small guy, and he, <laughs> he put hot water in it, put it, there was some kind of, how you say, a terrace outside the house. He put it in the open, then he, he uh, put off all his clothes and went inside and had a mask, you know, and we were watching him, you know, and that was really crazy, you know, the guy. <laughs> and the, the enemy, they were 100 meters away, and I'm sure there was the way they were watching him, but I think maybe they thought this guy is so crazy, you know, or uh, he does know what he's doing, so we leave okay. him alone, you know. Then after 10 minutes, he finished, he sure. put, off, put on his uniform, came back, you know. It was kind of funny, you know. A well, lot of stories like that. Oh, uh, sure. That's such a crazy thing. Well, one of the, I, I, I like the story about the, um, I like the story that you told about the, about stealing the parrot. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's also funny, but the guy is crazy. I, I, maybe I, I can tell it shortly to your listeners. Uh, that was during the war in, in Bosnia, in Mostar, which was a big city, and there was a yes. lot of house-to-house uh, -house fighting, urban combat. And uh, there was a no-man's land where, no, where there was no enemy between the front lines, and there were a lot of uh, empty apartments. And one of our guys, he decided to go there. I think he was, he, he liked uh, to drink a lot of alcohol. I think he wanted to, to find some wine or, or, or brandy or something. So uh, he, he, uh, yeah. he to, uh, took on some civilian clothes and went there. And uh, when he came into one uh, apartment, he heard some, some, somebody screaming and it was... Uh, Jena, Jena, that means woman, that's in Croatian, that means woman. And he thought that some, somebody, maybe an old man is, is calling his, his wife. She left him alone and he's now in a house. So he went after the guy, he was looking for the guy, but there was nobody in that flat. And then when he looked uh, behind the couch, he found there was a little cage with a parakeet, you know. And this, this bird, it was, it was calling <laughs> Jenna, 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 you know. So he took the bird <laughs> in that cage in one hand. In the other one, he found some alcohol, of course. He had a bottle of wine in the other hand. And uh, then he went back yeah. to, 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 our, to our lines, you know. But when he went back, he, he missed the road. And he turned up in another sector of the front line. Then the, the guards, the... the the guards, the Croatian guards, the soldiers, they didn't know who was coming there. They thought that's maybe the enemy. So they stopped him and they put a searchlight on him. And he was standing there in the dark in that searchlight with one hand with, 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 with that cage and other hand a bottle of wine. They stopped him. And uh, when they approached him, they asked him <laughs> for his military ID, you know. 
So he he he, he uh, took his yeah. hand into his back pocket to 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 take his military ID, but he forgot it wasn't there, and he stole some little pocket calculator and he put it in his back pocket. And instead of giving the soldiers the ID, he gave them a pocket calculator. And the same moment, the bird started shouting, Zena, Zena, you know? So they started, they, 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 they were sure, the Croats, this guy was totally crazy. And so they arrested him and brought him to the police station. And the police chief, he already knew him because it was obviously not the first time, you know, put him up and the next morning, they brought yeah. him back to us, and the, the police had told us the story. You know, it's very funny. You know? Yeah. Uh, so they so they ended up having a uh, a mascot, right? You know that the, the, the uh, yeah. I the, never the, knew what happened with the to the but I think he brought it to his mother, you know, in his flat, because he was still living with his mother when he wasn't with us on the front line. He was living uh, with his mother in a the flat there in Mosta. I, I think it was there. Wonder what happened with it. Ah, well, I hope he was. You know, they've used birds in combat before. You know, in fact, I, yeah, I, yeah. I had I, inter I interviewed a guy who uh, they they tried using bats in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I heard something about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it never worked. You know. What, what, what works? I mean, I had some friends, but it was after the war. They had some doves, you know. And they wanted to use them as messengers, you know. Yeah. And one morning, because they were bodyguards of the general, and one morning, these two guys, they came into the, it's a true story, they came in the office of the general with, with the, all these birds, you know. And general said, you want to do with yeah. the birds? They said, yeah, we can use uh -huh. them as men's messengers, general. And he kicked them out. He said, you're crazy. You know, we have radios. Yeah. Well, it's always funny with the with the animals. Oh, yeah, there was a, there's another thing. With the United States spent millions of dollars on something called Operation Acoustic Kitty. They got these cats. <laughs> they tried yeah. to use them. Yeah, to, I to mean, the, the funny thing... Against the yeah. Russians. Yeah. I think the CIA, they used cats as, you know, as a spy device. Yes. And then they put the antenna... They had the microphones, they put them in the ears of the poor animals, and the antenna was in the tail. <laughs> and uh, they, yeah, they did that with two cats, and the whole project cost $10 million. That was a lot of time <laughs> in the 60s, or when you did that. Yeah. And then they put the first cat out, and uh, instead of, of listening to some Russian agent or whatever they trained the cat to do, it was listening to the birds, you know, it was more interesting <laughs> for the cat. <laughs> and then they said that, that cat is worthless, you know. Then they took the second cat, and when they left it out of the car, it came another car and ran over the cat, and it was dead in five seconds, you know. Wow. So that was this project with the cat, you know. Oh, my gosh. Very it sad. Went kaput. Yeah, 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 yeah very, very sad. Well, listen, I mean, but then why is it that it's not a good idea to lose your, your uh, engagement ring in battle? Yeah, that, that happened, happened once. Did, uh, but... Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I tell you, uh, there was a was a young woman, and uh, it was during the war, and she was a refugee in our village. And uh, one night she gave me an engagement ring, you know, and uh, I and she I promised her to always carry it on my finger, and she said, of course, please don't lose it. You know, it was expensive. And the next morning, my, my commander said, look, let's go to the next village. There are some tanks, enemy tanks there. We, we take some anti-tank mines and we put them on the road. And so I went there. It was early in the morning, 4 o'clock. It was still dark. We put the mines. We dug some holes in the, in, the, in the streets, put the mines there, and went back. And there was some little well where we could, because we, we were digging with our hands, and uh, my hands were very dirty. So uh, we went to some well, had some water, took some buckets of water to wash our hands. And when I washed my hands, I saw that the ring was gone, you know. And I went to my oh. commander and said, we have to go back to the village where we put the mines. I said, why is that? Said, we can't go there anymore. It's getting a day now. It's too dangerous. I said, I, I, lost, the, I lost the ring, you know. I said, oh, my. and then we, we really went back, you know, but we saw that no chance, you know, because I didn't know where the hell the ring was. And uh, 
then uh, we were shout, uh, shooting a little bit in the air so that in the next village, the Albanians, they heard that there's some fighting or something. I went back to our village and then the girl came after a couple of hours and she immediately saw that I lost the ring and she asked, what's with the ring? I said, I told her some, some, some stories that we were fighting, that the enemy attacked us and in all the combat, I barely could save my own life, but I had, I had to, I lost the ring and then she hugged me and said, okay, forget the ring, I'm so happy that you're still alive, you know, that was... Oh, oh yeah, this is an interesting story, bro. There's more. Yeah, story. yeah. I mean, this is how soldier mentality. You know, you always have to to improvise. You know. So, I so, guess. so. Uh, let me understand. Was this um? So this is so. In other words, in in, in the Balkans, women propose to the men, or what? what how does that work? They uh, no, no, no. Normally, it's like it's like uh, in America. It's like in Germany, everywhere else. You know, but. Uh, I know uh, she was some kind of special woman, you know, maybe she was, I don't know, uh, but she gave me the ring and uh, it was an engagement ring, you know, so we were really engaged, but uh, and later, I think one week later, her family uh, fled to uh, Montenegro, crossed the border, then I never saw her actually. I, I later heard that she got married when she was in Montenegro with some other refugee and now she has two or three kids, but uh, never saw her again. Ah, uh, well, you know, but you went out in the end, now you married her. You, you yes, yeah, now I'm happy Was this in Albania? Yeah, was no, my wife? wife is from Kosovo, she's Albanian, but she's from Kosovo. I met her shortly after the war and uh, we immediately got engaged, married, and happy couple. Ah, so, great. Yeah. So wasn't she, yeah. wasn't she Miss, Al Miss Albania at some time, at one point? No, she is very beautiful. No, no, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, she's beautiful, maybe if she ran, but she didn't, so, you know. Ah, okay, great, great. So, what, I mean, what must be a big difference in personality between a, a German and a, an Albanian. How do you uh, get yeah, along? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that, is I get along. Is that mean, complicated? No, 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 no. Because uh, uh, her family is very modern, and she, she uh, as they were watching a lot of German TV there, you know, when they were really? young. Yeah, yeah, so they got all this German TV via satellite, and that's why so many people in Kosovo, they speak English and German, because they watched uh, the English or American or German TV, they grew up with it, so yeah. they, they knew all about, they know all about our mentality, you know, and it's not so, uh, it's so different now, it's, it's basically the same, you know, it's not, so I have, yeah. I wanted to ask you um, before. I mean, my life, I, I don't want to leave the book too too quickly, but is it possible to, for, for example, Serbians and Croatians and Kosovans to get along? <laughs> is that impossible? <laughs> it is possible, but not uh, in the Balkans. But if they are in Germany, for example, there's a good good story I never mentioned, but now I remember that you asked me. When I was in Bosnia during the war, I went to Germany on a holiday for New Year. Really? So I went there to visit a friend who is a Serb. And then was, I was a, in the Croatian army fighting the Serbs. I go to Germany on holiday, visit my friend who is a Serb. So this Serb, he lived, lived together in his apartment with a Croatian guy. With a who? And the Croatian guy was engaged oh, with a yeah. Serbian woman from Sarajevo, you know? And we, all the four of us, we went out to celebrate New Year, you know, and that was during the war. And it's only possible if you are in Germany and America, you know, because uh, the environment is not that uh, toxic, toxic, you know. But it, it would never have happened in, in Kosovo or Serbia, you know. If we would have met in Serbia, we would have, or in Kosovo, we would, maybe we would have killed each other, you know. But it was... Uh, in a peaceful environment, and you see when when uh, when the Croats or the Serbs come to Germany, uh, they uh, assimilate very quickly, and then they forget what happened in their country, and uh, they see that it's all a big big mistake. What what has happened there, you know? So, uh, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so it gets things settled down, and they get along. Yeah, That's yeah. Good. But uh, here, I, I I told you. Um, in uh, Kosovo, uh, Serbia, the situation is basically the same as it was 20 years ago, you know. Nothing what, changed. in Serbia? 
in Serbia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing changed. The, the people, even the Serbian politicians now, they were, the, they were already politicians under Milosevic during the war, you know. So uh, they're the same, the same breed, you know, the same people. Wow. It's really, nothing has changed there, you know. And that, do you see the mentality of the Serbs? Not everybody, of course, you know. There are people like you and me, there are people are a little bit more tolerant, but basically the, the majority is still the same, you know. It's very sad, you know, when you see that 20 yeah, years yeah, sure, hasn't sure. changed anything, terrible. you know. No. They're not so, just I mean, still looking it? backwards. They're not looking forward. They're still having a grudge, you know. And uh, oh, I mean, yeah. it's, that's really sad, you know. And I think if, if it weren't for the United States and for NATO, that they have such a big uh, footstep in Kosovo, uh, there would be a new war breaking out, you know, immediately. Oh man, it's, it's uh, terrible. And they, it's and terrible. That, you know, that's, that's where they started World War One. So why, uh, <laughs> you know? Yeah, they, I some... mean, yeah, yeah. This is really like they say, it's uh, it's explosive, you know, the Balkans, you know, and every big uh, big power has an interest there. Americans, you have Camp Bonsil there, which is, I think, the biggest uh, U.S. Army base in Europe. The Serbs, uh, the Russians and Serbia, they're practically 100 kilometers away from Bonsil. They have a base there, you know, so it's really, it's, uh, it's a hot spot, you know, like Berlin during the Cold War, you know. It's a ah, sure. bit like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's not easy. Huh? Makes, so listen. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It, it makes it... No, go uh, ahead. It makes it also an interesting place, you know, because in Kosovo, all, all, always something happens, you know. It's, I mean, it's very dynamic, you know, because uh, so Kosovo, many people. Yes. Is, is Kosovo like the Switzerland of the Balkans? No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> it's like, I, how, how, how can I explain that? No, it's, it's okay. It's, it's better than Albania, but I, I, every country there is the same, you know. If you see the standard of living, uh, there's much of a difference between Serbia, Montenegro, all the countries around Kosovo, you know. Croatia is, is different. Now, Croatia is now in the European Union, so they are a little bit richer now, you know, yeah. because they profit from tourism, from business. But uh, basically, it's, it's all the same, you know. It was so one Serbia, kind of Go ahead. Sorry? No, go yeah, ahead. I I was going to say Serbia. I mean, it's it's a little complicated. You have you have uh, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. That's a country now, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's a very divided country because there are three entities. You have the Serbs there, the Bosniaks, the, the Muslims, and the Croats. And practically, it's because the West of Western pressure that they're still in one state, that they have one country. You know, so they have everything. Three for there are three presidents: one Croat, one Bosniak, one Serb. They have three, three things for everything, you know. Because it is oh not a functional state. This, this state, it's the same like you know what I said before. It's only working, living with the pressure from the West. If the pressure isn't there anymore, it will fall apart, and the new war will break out. That's that's the situation. Right. Hasn't changed. How about Montenegro? What's what is Montenegro? Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's no, they are better off because uh, they uh, have they were always pro Serb, you know, but still they declared independence uh, from Serbia. They uh, recognized Kosovo as an independent state and they are very interested, they are very smart, the uh, Montenegrins. They try to be friends with everyone, you know, which is a good yeah. as, big thing, I think, you know. Because they are friends with the Serbs, the Serbs, they come there to make their summer holidays, they're good with Croats, they're their neighbors, even with the Kosovo people, they're very good. There are a lot of Kosovo, there are a lot of Albanians living in Montenegro, at the seaside, and uh, there are a lot of tourists from Kosovo there every year, you know. So I think Montenegro is one of the few countries in the Balkans that really that went out of all these wars, uh, how you say, with, with a good note, you know, they, they, they can do something. They are better off than many other countries around. Right, so then, okay, uh, a Spanish journalist who's memorable for a few reasons. Tell us about the Spanish journalist who was a memorable. Ah, yeah, that was yeah. my friend Miguel. And uh, I know him a little bit from Bosnia because he also covered the uh, war in Bosnia. He was a Spanish guy, 
and he was a lawyer, a corporate lawyer from Barcelona. And then he decided that lawyering wasn't for him. And he bought himself a motorbike and a camera and went to Sarajevo in Bosnia during the war. And then he got, uh, very soon he got hired by the Associated Press, the US uh, press agency. And uh, after Bosnia, he came to Kosovo, where I met him again. And he covered a lot of our, our, of our action from my unit, you know, because uh, most of the guys in my unit, they spoke English and it was easier for journalists to work with us. So we had them all the time around us. And uh, after a while, we, we, we became friends. And I remember I had a lot of talk with him, you know, not only about the war, but we talked about everything. He was interested in literature. And then uh, one day he asked me what kind of whiskey I prefer. And we were talking about whiskey. You know, he was a really good guy, you know, and calm guy. And then uh, the war went, was more intensive. Uh, that was shortly before NATO bombing. And I never saw him again. I thought, and then three weeks later, and that was really a terrible offensive, and we lost our base, and we were shelled, and we were, were fleeing to another village. And when I came in that village, I just wanted to sleep. And one hour later, somebody knocked on the door. I opened the door, and it was the Spanish guy, you know? And he uh -huh. just said, yeah, yeah, Miguel was his name, and he said, just uh, come with me. I said, well, where the hell he wants to go with me? Is it the, the subs are shelling the place. And he had a little Jeep there, Land Rover. He yeah. opened it, and there was a bottle of whiskey for me, you know. I don't know <laughs> where he found that bottle. And that was exactly the bottle, because two months before, I asked me what kind of whiskey you want, you know. It was a good surprise. Yeah. I took the say? bottle. I went to my friends. We drank the bottle, forgot the war for a night, and then Miguel went to, to another place. We had to fight again. And... Uh, then the next time I met him after the war, and uh, then he went to uh, Chechnya. He was covering the war ah, in Chechnya really? for the AP, and it was very really hardcore. And I met him once again. He came back to Pristina once again, and I saw that he was really he had a lot of problems because it was too much war. You know, he came from Bosnia to Kosovo to Chechnya, and Chechnya was really that was uh, very tough. And uh, then he went to Sierra Leone to cover the war in Sierra Leone and that way he uh, ran into an ambush. He was on a government army transport and they got ambushed and he was killed by another <laughs> journalist, you know. That was uh, really sad, you know. It was a yeah, good guy.